Hello everyone, welcome to the third part of my Let's Play series for the Barons War. In this video what I want to do is look a bit more closely at how you play through a turn of the game. We'll look at each of the phases, starting with the initiative phase, followed by the compulsory actions phase, the new actions phase, and then the final phase which is the housekeeping phase. We'll talk about how each of them works and what you have to do in each phase. And then also as well, I'd like to have a little bit more of a look at how some of the, um, the troop status kind of work. They're sort of like the um, conditions they can be in. So um, being broken, being shocked, or being weary. So first things first, I've set up my table. Um, it's on about, about four foot by three and a half foot. It should be played on a four by three, but I've set it out like this just so that we can fit the, fill the table with terrain. And also so you can really get a feel for how a, how a board can look because it's a skirmish game. You want a lot of terrain on your table. I've put down a couple of um, retinues. I've not bothered working out the points values. I'm not going to bother thinking about the um, the experience levels for each. Um, I might swap and change experience levels to illustrate certain points, but it won't make much of a difference. So what we've got is we've got on this side, we've got a veteran sergeant leading a group of foot sergeants. We've got some spearmen equipped with bills. They've also got shields. I don't think that would physically be possible to fight with both, but we'll go with it. We've got some bowmen over here. And on the other side, we've got a, um, a lord, a baron. I'm going to go for the lower of the two. So each commander has two command actions, just to keep it simple. We've got some spearmen. We've got a group of bows. And then we've also got a couple at the back here of mounted sergeants. So in a turn of the Baron's War, there's four phases. The first phase is the initiative phase. This essentially decides which player goes first. The second phase is compulsory actions. This is where you have to do any actions which are, as it suggests, compulsory that you have to take before you can issue any new actions. New actions come in the third phase, which is then followed by the housekeeping phase, which is essentially tidying up everything and then preparing for another turn. So, as I said, split into four phases. Each player takes a turn activating their groups. They can issue actions, reactions, going back and forth. And once you finish a phase, you cannot go back to a, an earlier phase. There is one slight caveat with that when we talk about um, compulsory actions and new actions, because there's a little bit of a crossover at times. But the general rule is that, say you're at the housekeeping phase, you can't then go back from housekeeping and start dishing out actions. Once you are done, you're done. So the first phase is the initiative phase. This determines which player goes first. So each player would roll a d10. Let's say that the veteran sergeant here is on the white dice and the, the lord or baron, I can't remember which way it goes, is on the black dice. Both players roll a d10. Whoever gets the highest gets the initiative. So five for the Baron, I'm trashing my terrain here already, and a one for the Veteran Sergeant. So that would give the Baron initiative. What you can do is commanders can spend a command action to give them another dice. So say the Baron here is desperate for the initiative, he can spend a command action and get another dice. Now, I can't remember which way around I did it, but let's say in this turn that the Baron here, or the Bishop, Peter de Roche, has got two dice to roll, whereas the Veteran Sergeant has only got one. In this situation, he would still win, but it basically increases his chances of being able to roll higher. Say, for example, this guy on this side rolled better, and he rolled seven, and the Bishop had only rolled a five, rolling one dice, the veteran sergeant would have got it. But because he's rolled two and he's got the eight, he takes it, gets initiative. What you do need to remember, and this will be relevant as you go through turns, if a commander has got a score on their morale dice, say you put a morale dice on the bishop here, and he rolls his dice, he effectively has to take that away they'd have to take that away from their dice score. So say, for example, the bishop here had a two on his morale dice. You then roll. If he rolls a six, 
that then goes down to a four. So you have basically your a minus two modifier for your dice or whatever your current morale score is. Once initiative has been determined, you then have to take any compulsory actions that you have to do before you can move into the new actions phase. So really for compulsory actions, they're things that say a group is out of your control. Um, you have to take this action in order to be able to bring them back into your control, or at least attempt to bring them to your control. Most of the time, these groups would start with a token indicating that actually they're out of control. So for example, if someone is, um, is broken, if they're broken, they'd have to start the turn with the token indicating they're broken. If they're shocked, they'd have the token indicating that they are shocked. They then have to take a compulsory action, which in this situation would be to rally. If a group has finished out of coherency, for example, they're spread all over the place, their first action would have to be compulsory move action to bring them back together again. So as I mentioned, there is a bit of a caveat in that you cannot move from one phase to the other until you go back and forth. Um, and it took me a couple of times of reading this in the rule book to understand it. And I asked in the Facebook group just to make sure my understanding was correct. You could have a scenario where a player is still carrying out their compulsory actions. So they're in the compulsory action phase, whilst another player is carrying out their uh, new actions. So say, for example, that this player has two broken units. This player has one broken unit. In a situation where the veteran sergeant over here has initiative, he would attempt to rally his unit. If his rally is successful, he takes off his token. Play then switches over to the bishop. The bishop would then attempt to rally these rally this group. He takes off the token. It then switches back to the veteran sergeant, who can then, if he wishes, issue a new action. For example, he could issue a move action. It would then switch back to the bishop, who would then rally here. So the bishop is completing his um, compulsory action still, but the other player, the veteran sergeant, is back onto his new action. So there is a slight crossover, but what it really gives is a bit of a tactical edge to the game. So you can take advantage of your opponent having to take their compulsory actions by getting in first while they're still taking compulsory actions. The next phase is the new actions phase. So with the new actions phase, as I just mentioned, you can do a variety of different things. So you can assign actions, you can declare reactions, or you can pass. Passing means that you can take no action and initiative passes back to the other player. So if the bishop has initiative, but he wants to see and wait and see what his opponent's going to do, he can pass, which would then pass initiative over to the opponent. There are limits on your ability to pass. You can only pass three times before you must take an action. If your opponent chooses to pass, there can only be three passes between the two of you before the turn ends and you move on to the housekeeping phase and go on to the next turn. So if the bishop decides to pass, it passes over to the sergeant. If the sergeant passes, it passes back to the bishop. If the bishop then passes again, the turn ends onto housekeeping and then you move into the next turn or next round even. Now in terms of what actions can be dished out, we spoke about this in the previous um, videos where we looked at the tokens. But you can give a move, which is the green one. You can give a combat, which is the ready one. And this one applies for both ranged and um, melee um, attacks. You can give a defend, which is the blue one. You can give a command, which as we saw a moment ago is the yellow one. Or you can use an ability, which is the purple one. Those are the actions that you can give. In terms of reactions, you can give essentially the same with a slight difference. So you can give a combat, you can give a defend, you can give a command, or you can give an ability order. The only one you can't give is a move. So if you're reacting to something your opponent's done, you cannot move out of the way. So for example, if I was to charge, um, the 
veteran sergeants into the spearmen here, I could not give the spearmen a move action and tell them to get out of the way. I could give them an attack action, which would tell them to attack back. I could give them a defend action, which would basically give them a uh, improved um, defense role. I could get them to use an ability or I could use a commander to issue a command to them to react. This would go back and forth between players until all of your units have taken their actions. So let's imagine for the moment that we've just played the first turn of the game. Every group has taken an action and so there's a load of tokens on the table. Let's, for example, say that the archers ran up to here. So that was their first action. The bishop moved up using one of his actions and then he used his command to command these guys to shoot. And for argument's sake, let's say they shot at the bowmen and caused no wounds. We won't worry about wounds and things like that yet. We're talking strictly about the tokens. The Because the bowmen ran, they become weary. But also, because they've attacked, they've completed two actions, they would become weary anyway. The spearmen here have moved up. They've only completed one action, so they no other effects affecting them at the minute. The horsemen at the back, they moved using one action. On the other side, the veteran sergeant, the commander here, took a defense action. So he gets a defense token. The, uh, the spearmen here, my, my armed with bills, they moved. But then, oh, I forgot to put one down actually. That's on me. The veteran sergeant used the command token to give them a defense action. And then at the back here, the bowmen fired, uh, attacked. Again, let's pretend they caused no casualties. So in this instance here, because this group has carried out two actions, they're weary. These ones ran, so they're weary, but also they carried out two actions. We'll talk a bit more about weary in a bit, and then we'll talk a bit more about broken and shocked. But for the minute, this is how a turn would essentially move into the housekeeping phase. So at the end of this turn, you go around and you remove any tokens that are down. You would also, if there had been casualties, amend the morale dice. But we'll talk about that again in a little bit, just because that's a little bit more complex. So both players would go through, take off their tokens. And you notice here for the minute, I'm leaving the weary tokens. Again, we'll talk a bit, about, a bit more about that in a minute. At the moment, these have not got any, any score on their morale dice. So the weary tokens come off as well. So let's presume we've just played through another turn of the game. We've gone through the initiative phase, in which both players rolled to determine who would get to go first. We've gone through the compulsory actions phase, of which there were none. We've gone through the new actions phase, in which the players dished out actions, reactions back and forth. And now we've come back again now to the housekeeping phase. So looking around what we've got, you've got the bishop here has moved up and attacked the billman. He's won the combat, he's pushed them back, he's caused two casualties, so they've got a two score on their morale dice. They took a defense reaction, didn't help them, they've lost men. Because they have lost more than 25% of their initial number, they had to take a morale check. Let's say, for example, they failed the morale check, they're now broken, is indicated by the brown token there. Because they are broken, they have to take their full move immediately away from the attacker. So they would go, let's for argument say, say they're equipped with mail, they would move back their full move. Over here, the veteran commander attacked these guys, attacked the, um, the, the spearmen. He won the combat, caused three wounds. This would put the unit into shock because they've lost more than their 
than 50% of their, their unit number. And we'll talk a bit more about this in a minute. And I've got a table that I will put up on the screen to explain the difference between broken and shock. But because they're shocked, they immediately gain, well, they'd have to take a morale test, sorry. Because they failed the morale test, for argument's sake, they're immediately shocked. They have to gain a shock token, and they also gain a weary token. Let's say these guys shot at the archers over in the corner. They caused one casualty, so there is a score of one on this casualty dice over here. This uh, morale dice, sorry. Let's say these guys, these archers, shot at the mounted sergeant. He took a defense reaction. His defense reaction did absolutely nothing for him, and they took a casualty, so he's got a score of one on his morale dice. Each commander still has one command action left, so for argument's sake, again, the bishop commands the archers to shoot the back of the archers, does nothing, cause no more action, no more, um, no more casualties. These guys, because they've taken a second action, become weary. The veteran sergeant, and I know this is a bit out of range for command, but let's just go with the flow. He gives a command to the archers to fire back at the archers behind the wall. They don't cause any casualties, but because they've taken a second action, they're weary as well. So to clarify as well, these guys here only started with two models. They have technically lost 50% of their group. So would become shocked. However, in the shocked section of the rule book, it explains that if you have less than three models in a group, you essentially cannot become shocked. You would become broken instead. But for argument's sake, again, I keep saying that over and over, let's say this guy's taken a morale check and he's actually passed a morale check. So he's fine. There's only one of him left, but he's absolutely fine. In the housekeeping phase, we go through. We take away tokens, but also we adjust morale dice. So let's work through these one by one. Commanders, both take away their tokens. They're absolutely fine. The mounted sergeant, take away the token, and because he's not broken or shocked or suffering any other effects, or weary, you reduce this down by one, so this comes away. If it was a higher number, say they started with three, and you know, you know what I mean, if he started with three and he's taken two casualties, that would go down to one, and he keeps one over there. These bowmen here, Although they are weary, they've not taken any casualties, so they do not have to do anything. They can simply take away their tokens. The guys at the back here, to be able to you take away the tokens, but to be able to actually adjust this down, because they've taken a casualty, they have to pass a morale check first. Let's say they pass a morale check, you take away their tokens, and you take away the dice. These guys here who are broken, you would take away the defense action. That goes. You reduce the morale by one. So that goes from a two down to a one. But the weary token stays there. They have to rally to be able to get rid of that broken token. And if they do not rally, there are certain things they have to do in the compulsory actions phase. For the guys who are shocked, Nothing happens to their morale. So these guys are in absolute disarray. They've been attacked. They've seen so many guys wiped out. They're just stood there, feet planted to the ground, thinking, here we come, Jesus, we're going to die. So the morale dice stays the same. Pretty sure they keep the weary token and they keep the shocked token. They have to rally in order to be able to get rid of these. So at the end of the turn, you'd essentially be looking at all the groups bar the shocked and the weary, no, sorry, broken, have returned to play and they're within control. That is how you would end the turn and move on to the next one. So let's say in our example now, we've moved on to the next turn, we've rolled for initiative, the bishop got a six, whilst the Veteran Sergeant got a four. So initiative is with the bishop. 
Initiative's been decided, we move now onto the compulsory actions phase. So compulsory action for this would be to try and attempt to rally these guys. So you can either rally using the group's own action, or if you've got a commander within range, they can attempt to spend a command to rally the group. The same goes for the broken troops. So essentially rallying is to pass a morale check. So you compare the morale uh, value they've got in their profile. You roll a D10, and if you get higher, boom, 10, that would pass. If you get lower, you're still shocked or still broken. So say initiative is with this group, with the um, commander. Let's say these guys attempt to rally, they fail. So they stay exactly where they are and exactly the condition they're in, which is very important when we get through to the new actions phase. If the broken troops over here attempt to rally, if they successfully rally, and this applies for shock troops as well, they rally, you take away the broken token, they can carry out new actions, but they gain a weary token. So they'll be able to partake in the battle, but they'll be doing so weary, which again, we'll cover again a little bit in a minute. So as we said, a successful rally action brings the group back into your control. At that point, they can act as normal and take part in the battle. If they do not rally, there are different things that happen to them. So going first to the shocked group. If a shocked group doesn't rally, they stay exactly where they are. They cannot move. If someone attacks them, so say, for example, during his activation, the commander here takes an attack and moves in fight them you know you get it what i mean i'm not going to move them over they get a plus two modifier to their attack so they are going to be killing them much easier these guys can defend so they can use their shield they're not their shield sorry they can use their um defense role to defend but they cannot use a shield so essentially these guys are exceptionally vulnerable and are likely to die really because a plus two modifier and not being able to use a shield is really going to hurt these guys if they get attacked broken groups act a little bit differently so a broken group as we saw previously once you break you immediately move your full distance away from the attacker if you do not rally you must run directly towards your nearest own table edge so these guys would have to run that direction which is a double move so say for example we were saying that they were equipped with mail that would be eight inches in that direction if they're equipped with leather armor it would be 10 inches in that direction so a broken group can get off the table pretty fast if you do not rally them if they are caught by another group for example if this lone ranger over here were to charge into them using an attack action his attacks would automatically hit so he doesn't even need to roll to hit them range attacks say if i were to try and attempt to shoot with these guys before charging in range attacks do have to roll to hit but broken groups again in a similar way to shocked groups can defend but they cannot make a shield roll so any melee attacks are going to hit, and if you do not defend it, you're going to die. You cannot use your shield, so again, exceptionally vulnerable if you're broken. Now, in the first game that I played, we struggled a little bit with the difference between being shocked and being broken. And to cover, like, clarify a couple of bits that we had issues with, you cannot be broken and shocked at the same time. So you're only one or the other. So I'm quickly going to put a table up on the screen and talk through the differences between being broke and being shocked. I apologize if any of this is wrong, but it's been something I've tried to get my head around and I kind of feel like I've got it now, but guarantee there's going to be something wrong. So 
in the first column here, you can see what happens if you are broken. So in order to be broken, you must lose a combat action. So for example, where we saw there the billmen, they lost the combat to the bishop. They suffered, they have suffered up to this point, a cumulative 25% casualty. So the same can happen with ranged attack. If you've taken a cumulative 25%, so 25% of your total starting group are dead, you then had to take a morale check. If you pass a morale check, you're fine. Don't worry about it. If you fail morale check, you're broken. If you break, you gain a broken token, and then you immediately move your full distance away from the attacker. That's not a run, that's just a move. From that point onwards, you can only be given rally actions. In the following rounds, if you do not rally, you have to run, which is a double move, directly towards your nearest own table edge. And with some of the um, deployment um, so, so like setups in the game, that could be multiple edges of the board. You have to run towards your nearest edge. And as Rulebook states, if you run off the table edge, the, the uh, group to remove from play, that's it, they're out. If you're attacked, melee attacks automatically hit. So in the example we saw there, if the uh, mounted sergeant was to charge in, he would automatically hit. Ranged attacks still have to roll. You can defend, but you cannot make a shield roll. If you're shocked, and there's a little bit of a, a difference here, you've lost 50% or more of your current models during a single combat phase. So say, for example, you start with uh, four models, and in a single combat phase you lose three, you are shocked. Or if you lose 25% of casualties from a particular weapon type, so, for example, um, lances cause shock, and crossbows short, shot at short range also cause shock. So certain weapons can cause shock. If you become shocked, you gain a shock token. You also gain a weary token. So everything you're doing now is at a minus one modifier to any dice roll. So that's pain in the butt as well. You can only be given rally actions. Again, rallying would be passing a morale check but you're at a minus one to your morale, and then also taking into account any morale modifiers that you've got from taking casualties. So you are rolling at a serious disadvantage. If you're attacked, your attacker gains a plus two to all attack, from attack dice. You can defend, but you can't use a shield. So very similar to being broken in that respect. As I mentioned, if a group contains three or fewer warriors before losing any casualties, you can't become shocked. Instead, you'd be broken. And for a command group, if a command group becomes shocked whilst it still has actions available, it loses those actions. It can't use those actions to rally. That's it. You have to wait until the next turn. So now I want to talk about the effect of being weary. So weary, being weary, as we've explained a couple of times, happens in different ways. You become weary by running. So we saw earlier when these guys ran from back here upwards, they perform a double move, they become weary. If you perform multiple actions, so when these guys have shot using their own action, then shot from the commander's order, they become weary. Commanders are a special type of unit as in they get more than one action. We've seen that before. They have to spend at least one action on themselves, but they can still become weary. So if they were to perform two actions, they would become weary. Let's try and show this as an example. So if, for example, let's try to think of a way of doing this. Um, right. Say the veteran sergeant here wanted to move. They can move and they can spend a move token on themselves. That's fine. They can do that, no issues. If they want to give a command out, <clears throat> they can. And as we've seen, you can give a command, you can order someone else to do something. He would have become weary from doing that. And he's used one action on himself, which is fine. If he wanted to do something else himself, say, for example, he wanted to attack, say he was moving a long way across the board, and you, can, you know what I'm showing you there, he would become weary because he has now taken two actions for himself. If you've got a baron, which is the higher level commander, they have three actions. 
So they could give two commands and perform one action themselves, or they can perform two actions themselves and give one command, or they could perform three actions themselves, but when they perform that second action, they become weary. So it becomes a bit more difficult to actually make the most of having those extra actions because you'll be suffering the penalties for being weary. You also become weary if you are shocked, and if you rally after being broken, you lose the broken token, but gain a weary token. Now, being weary is a bit of a double-edged sword because being able to perform two actions, for example, two ranged attacks, is very good. But there's certain problems with that. Being weary gives you a minus one to all dice rolls whilst that weary token remains in play. So anything these guys want to do after having successfully rallied, anything they want to do is done at a minus one on their dice roll, which is pretty, pretty horrific. Say, in the, for example, in the next turn, they pass a morale check and they manage to move, remove this dice and the weary token goes away, then they're back to normal. That's no problem. You can't have more than one weary token. So, say, for example, using the um, commander, if it was a baron, and using him three times, he doesn't get two weary tokens. He only gets one. The effects don't stack. So once you're weary, you are weary. And as we've discussed previously, weary tokens are the last thing to be removed. So the very last thing you would do is remove that minus one modifier and move on to the next phase. So I hope this makes sense. It's probably a little bit back to front me doing this it this way, but I wanted to talk about the phases, what you do in each phase, but then also some of the more complex things like broken, shocked, and weary, because they sort of um, they're very important in each phase, and also they kind of transcend some of the phases. So some of these tokens will last from the housekeeping phase, for example, being shocked or being broken into the next initiative phase. That then is why you have to perform the compulsory actions that bring the groups back under your control that you had lost. So I hope you've liked this video. Um, it's still a very new format for me. I'm getting used to how to do, how to play videos. Um, my setup's not particularly great, but I've got all my own terrain. I've got all the models. So I thought, you know what? I should do it. Um, so thank you for watching. And yep, if you've enjoyed it, please subscribe. Please share it, please like it, all that sort of, uh, all that junk. And I'll catch you all in the next video. Bye.